Our dear viewers and listeners, we we'll greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to today's Bible study. Brought to you from Dominion Church International we request you as always invite somebody to join us as we dwell in this word that changes lives and your life will not remain the same before we begin today's session let's take a moment to pray let's pray Father, we thank you. Yes, we welcome your presence, yes, your wisdom, your glory, your power. Mm. That as your word goes forth, it goes forth in power yes, and simplicity mm. to change lives, yes, to open our eyes mm. to the glory of God our Lord and Savior. Mm. And we pledge that after all is said and done, mm. the praise, the glory, and the honor mm. belongs to you alone. Mm. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are taking today's reading from the book of Romans, chapter 6, from verse 20 to verse 22. And this is what the Bible says. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God you have your fruit to rise sanctification and the end everlasting life. Today we will speak on the subject the slave that you were versus the slave that you now are. In the, the verses that we just have prayed, Paul continues on the subject of slavery. And in this passage, he shows us the transition a believer makes. From the moment of their conversion, from one type of slavery to another. Last week we dealt on the subject, which was a question. Whose slave are you? Basically, what that meant that everybody on the face of this earth is a slave. And it is very important for you to understand whose slave you are. Before we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we understood that we were slaves to sin. Held in bondage of sin. Now when we come to God, we become the slave of God and are now obedient to a new master. Basically what we are saying there is never a moment in one's life when you are not a slave. And what we need to emphasize in today's text is that there is no transition period. There is no neutral territory. There is no point in your life when you are not a slave to 
to somebody. So your conversion to Christ Christo. Open the door from the prison of sin. Your chains were broken. And you are now ushered out of the former bondage of sin. Immediately, you are now ushered into a new form of slavery. This is the new slavery to righteousness. And why is that important? It is important because currently, there is a school of thought that there is that place where there is no lordship at all. Where you have been freed from the slavery of sin and you now become a Christian. Yet at the same time, you are, Jesus is not your Lord. So you have been set free but you are not surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This kind of thought or this kind of teaching does not have a place in Scripture. And what this teaching tries to stress is that at some point down the road, maybe five, ten years down the road, you come to a point where you now dedicate your life to Jesus Christ. So you come to a point where you come become serious with God. Now you realize Jesus is the Lord of your life. And now you submit to him as your Lord. So what then that tries to bring in is that there is a second work of grace or a second level of commitment to Christ. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And today's subject or today's text helps us understand that the moment you converted to Christ, you are released from the slavery of one who is sin. And now you have become the slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have the three verses that we read broken down into two themes verse 20 and verse 21 deals with the slave we were. Verse 21 paints the picture of the slave that we now are. What does that imply? Now this implies that there is a stark contrast between who you were and who you are. There is a great difference between the master you had before and the master that you have now. So Paul paints the picture and begins with the word for. And this word for is very important. Because it right through all chapter 6. We see it six times. In chapter 6 alone. We see it in verse 5. Verse 7. Verse 10. Verse 14. Verse 20. And verse 23. So why is this important? Why is Paul using this? Is it because he lacks vocabulary? Not at all. Here he uses the word for to introduce an explanation for what he has previously stated. So what has he previously stated? What he has previously stated in verse 19 is the urge for us to present our members as slaves to righteousness resulting into sanctification. 
So now he gives us the reason. Now he gives you the reason why you as a believer need to present the members of your body as slaves to righteousness. And the members of your body, we talked about them in great detail. That is every part of your being. Your heart, your mind, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your feet, your hands, even your stomach. So everything that you represent needs to be handed over. So though you were previously a slave to sin, now you are no longer under that bondage. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are now a slave of God and righteousness. So Paul is here stating one fact that you now need to live out the reality of what you have already become. So let's break it down for us. In verse 20, he says, For when you were slaves of sin, and here he's talking about all believers who were previously slaves of sin. He's stating a fact that every single believer was once a slave of sin. So every one of us, irrespective of whether you were born in a church setting, grew up with Christian parents, went in a Christian school, had Christian friends, was able to memorize the, the Bible verses, you were still a slave to sin. Your former life was lived in the prison of the house of sin. Your heart and your mind were enslaved. There is no way your mind or your affections were not enslaved. And you did not have the will to break free. Your entire being was enslaved to sin. And that you need to understand that you lived under the dominion of sin. Or put it another way, every individual upon the face of this earth who has not given their life to Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord is still under the dominion of sin. The only difference is the environment because the environment then makes it more complex. So if you came from a background of witchcraft, then it is intense at that point. But still the bottom line is, whether the family was involved in sorcery or not, the point still lies that you were under the dominion of sin. And Paul adds then that you were free in regard to righteousness. Now this may confuse you if you're using the English version. And you need to ask yourself, how was I then free in regard to righteousness. Now, free in this regard carries the idea that before your conversion, 
you are without any power to fulfill the righteousness that God requires. So you, you are free from any obligation to fulfill pursue righteousness. So you did not have the moral ability within you to be righteous. So this is the this is not free will. This means there is nothing about you. In other words, you are completely disconnected from the righteousness of God. Powerless to perform it. Powerless to even pursue it. Powerless to even choose it. So you are going on one tangent and the righteousness of God was in another direction. And it is at that point then that Paul poses the question in verse 21 and says, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? Or basically, what benefit? Or what was the benefit of whatever you did? What was the benefit that you derived from the things which you are now ashamed? There he introduces the word benefit, which is the Greek word kapos. And it is the word where you get words like fruit, advantage, or profit. So the point is driving home is, what was the profit? What advantage was it to you? He is referring to the deeds of the flesh, which you did before you became born again. And he is now stressing that those things that you did then, you are now ashamed of them. And here he uses the Greek word epaiskunomai, which means to feel shame. And this epaiskunomai is actually the mark of a true Christian. The mark of a true believer is that one has repented of their past sin. Why do you repent of them? Because now you are ashamed of them. You have confessed and turned away. Confession means you are agreeing with what God says you are. Now you turn away from the life that you once lived before you were born again. So that is important. And it does not matter the environment that you grew in. Your environment may not have been violent. But still there are other sins of the soul. Like idolatry. Coveting. Being self-centered. Deception. Living for self rather than living for God. All, all, all these you are now ashamed of. So as a believer, and that is why it's very important when people are beginning to give a, a testimony about their lives. See, the things you previously glorified, now you, you, they are the things we are ashamed of. So if when you are talking about your past life, you are glorifying the who you were before, you bring to question, did you actually repent of your life? 
Because if you repented of it, you should be ashamed of it. So you cannot speak about it in a glorifying way. Why? Because the things you loved then, not when you come to the faith in Jesus Christ, they, they are the things you now hate. Or let me put it this way. When you come to Jesus Christ, there is a then and there is a now. And there has to be a very clear line between then and now. The things you then hated, now you love. You love the things of God. You love to pray. You love to worship. Now, you, you love them now. Before, you just didn't even understand why somebody would spend 15 minutes of their time in prayer. Now, for you, spending an hour in the presence of God is a delight. Why? Because who you are then is different from who you are now. And this is the distinguishing mark of a true believer in Jesus Christ. Every true believer in Jesus Christ will never glamorize their past. When you find somebody glamorizing their past, that is a red flag. They are not truly converted. For Paul continues in the text and says, for the outcome or for the end of these things is death. And that is the reason we can't glory in them. Because the end of these things led to only one place. Death. And death, death is talking about now. It's with reference to eternal separation. Eternal condemnation. Eternal torment. Eternal punishment. It is going to that place where Jesus refers it to as where the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Basically, the outcome of a life lived without Jesus Christ is the second death. And this includes death throughout all the ages to come. And it is a choice that we make why we are still alive. So if you are born again, you have chosen life. That is what you were delivered from. So once you are enslaved, and many times we stop at that. We don't see the end. We don't see the outcome. The outcome of that life was the fire that does not quench. So you were once enslaved in sin before you come to the salvation that is Jesus Christ. And this is not a new teaching. Jesus himself taught the same principle. Let's look at his dialogue in John chapter 8. He has this dialogue with the Jews. And John chapter 8 verse 31 the Bible records that Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in me, or if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. 
He is making a very important point here that the mark of authentic discipleship is perseverance. It is endurance in obedience to the truth. It is staying with the words that Jesus has spoken in spite of the circumstances that surround you. It is to you saying, let God be true and every man a liar. I will stay holding on to what Jesus has said. A true believer in Jesus Christ holds on to the truth in spite of the changing circumstances. So your theology does not change because the circumstances are adverse. No, it doesn't fizzle out. You stay focused on what he has said. So for many people who begin strong and on fire for the Lord, and afterwards they fizzle out, they no longer follow after Jesus Christ. They no longer adhere to his word. This is the message for you. The prolonged lifestyle of disobedience is evidence that you were never a disciple of Jesus Christ. True discipleship abides. True discipleship stays in the word. Jesus says you are indeed my disciples. And in verse 32, he says, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. He is driving a very important point here. What he's stating is this. If the truth makes you free, then previously, before you came to the truth, you were not free. You see that? He's saying, when, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So what makes you free is the truth that you know that you come to the knowledge of. This is what makes you free. But what you also need to understand is that if it is this truth that makes you free, then when before this truth came be, to make you free, you were under bondage. You were not set free. <laughs> you were a slave. You were enslaved by something. So he now is bringing something very important. That before we come to him, we are previously slaves. And we are slaves to sin. And being slaves to sin places us under the dominion of Satan. And but I want you to see how the Jews respond. They come to him and tell him, but we are Abraham's descendants. And what is it that they are trying to claim? They are claiming the right relationship with God because of their heritage as Jews. So what they are trying to say 
is that because we are Jews, we have a right standing with God. And because we are, we have a right standing with God, based on our heritage, we have never been enslaved by anyone. So how do you then declare that you, we will become free. So what they mean here is that they were not enslaved at all. But remember, these were people who even physically, forget the spiritual, were under slavery of Rome. But let's not go there. Let's stay with what Jesus is trying to point out here. Jesus responds to them in verse 34 and says, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Basically, he's saying the lifestyle of sin is evidence that you are under slavery of sin. So to habitually practice sin is to simply state that I am a slave of sin. And he says, I know that you are Abraham's descendant. Yet you seek to kill me because my word has not found a place in you. And the reason, because my word has not set you free. <laughs> that is the reason you are seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth. Now this accusation Jesus presents to them he's trying to deliver a very important message that no matter your parental heritage or your upbringing until you believe in the truth of the gospel you remain a slave to sin and it's not just Jesus who spoke about this the disciples did also teach the same. And we will pick an example of two. Paul in his letter to Timothy and Peter. Let's begin with Paul. In his letter to Timothy, where he admonishes him not to get engaged into useless wars. This is what he advises in 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 24 to 26. And he says, and as a servant of the Lord, you must not quarrel but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. But the gist of the matter is in verse 26. Where he states, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. What Paul is here stating is that these people are now captives of the devil. 
Badu, bawambe, basitani, Whatever they are doing, they are doing the will of the devil. They cannot escape except when the word of truth comes to them. So they don't have the freedom to do their will because they are now held in captivity. The devil himself has them in his grasp. In the same way, Peter when he's writing concerning the false teachers, pointing out their depravity and deception. In 2 Peter chapter 2 from verse 18 to 19, he says, for they speak great swelling words of emptiness. They are lower through lusts of the flesh through lewardness the one who have actually escaped from those who live in error and he says why they promise them liberty they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So what he's trying to say is this. Whatever overcomes you, enslaves you. So the, the theme of slavery goes throughout the pages. So before Christ, you are held as a slave of sin. You are overtaken by sin. And it is Christ that comes to your life that then sets you free. So, you being lost in sin, you're not just a slave to sin. You are also a slave of sin. So, your mind, your emotions, everything about you Sin had it in its grip. But this is the good news. Verse 22. He says, but now, in the life of every believer, there has to be a but now. It was then, but now. He says, but now since you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, you have your benefit resulting in sanctification. And by this he means being made holy, being set apart for God's purposes. And this has an outcome and the outcome is eternal life. That's the overview. Now let's break it down. He says, but now having been set, having been freed from sin and are now enslaved to God, what that means in the life of every believer, there is a but now. And so this signals a state of grace. And now you are found in that grace. So he says, having been freed, and this is a passive participle verb, having been freed. So this is not active voice. So it is not you doing the action. Having been freed means somebody else 
did the action. You were the one being acted upon. You and I were the ones being set free. The one who sets us free is Jesus Christ. We were the ones being liberated. Remember he says, and if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. This is God acting to set you free. And how is this done? Remember, this is God's design, the design of God the Father. Working through Jesus, God the Son, to set you free, and now this is being applied by the Holy Spirit in your life. So it is this mighty work being done on you that sets you free, that breaks the chains of bondage and delivers you from the former life of slavery, of sin. So it is not what you do. It, what, it is what has been done to you. So, until you understand that, you will get caught up in so many things. You think it is you to deliver yourself from bondage. No, you have been set free. You have been freed from sin. Now, what have you been freed from? Not the practice of sin. From the dominion of sin. And this was part of the redemption by Christ Jesus, which we saw in Romans 3.24, that you have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. That means he entered into the marketplace of sin and paid the price to purchase and deliver you who believes in him. So he died in order to set us free from our former slavery. Having purchased you, you now belong to him. Having purchased you, he is now your master because he bought you with the price of his blood. He paid the penalty for the curse of the law and that penalty was death. And that is why he had to die the good news is this he now has freed us from sin so that we no longer continue to live in it so there is no believer who has been genuinely saved that would want to continue in that sinful life. If you want to continue to live the sinful life, then it is the sign that that person is still under the slavery of sin. He does not belong to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The, his rightful Lord is not Jesus. His rightful Lord is sin and the devil. So, the point is this. When you come to Jesus Christ, you come to a new Lord. Lord. You come to a new master, one who loves you, one who takes care of you, one who meets your needs, one who lives in you, one who directs your life, one who guides you every step of the way. You, you cannot desire any better master. 
this is a complete different master that you have. The scripture in emphasizes that you will now become enslaved to God. So this is the deal. You are either a slave of sin when that sin is broken over your life. You now become a slave of God. So there is no middle ground here. There is nothing you bargain for. You are either this way or that way. This doesn't happen like five seconds after. Or 10 minutes after, or 10 years after, or 10 weeks later. The end of this is the beginning of this. Romans 5.21 It says we were once under the reign of sin but are now under the reign of grace. Once sin ends grace begins. So the, this, uh, this is the drawing line. We do do not have a no man's land in between. Jesus now becomes your master and Lord. And this is not the end. Paul explains to us that this comes with a benefit. You derive a couple's there is a benefit that comes with this. There is a fruit that comes with this. And the fruit is holiness. This you are now sanctified. Or sanctification. Which is the Greek word hagiasmos. So you are now separated. And we told you that separation has two aspects. The negative and the positive. The negative aspect is what you are separated from. You are separated from the dominion of sin. We are separated from the devil. You are separated from the world. <coughs> now you have been separated to God. You are separated to his image. To his likeness. And to his purposes. The old material is gone away. New material has come in. That's what Paul explains. He says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your life is now hid in Christ. In God. So what we are seeing is the new you who bears the likeness of Christ. So you now begin to grow more into Christ likeness. And the outcome of this journey is everlasting life is eternal life. This is the inevitable that comes to you. So this is the phase of unending life. You become the slave of God which means you have a new master who you are obedient to. You have a new heart. You have a new direction of life. You have the new life in you. You are down the narrow path, a new path in life. Which then leads you to a new destiny. This is a change that is so tremendous. And this 
happens the day you convert to Christ. And so you need to understand this as a believer. That once you are from here, you come to Christ. Everything changes. You have a new mind. You have a new heart. You have a new outlook of life. You are guided by new principles. You have a new test. You have new affections. New likes. You have new dislikes. You have you have new fears. You have new joys. You have new things that you love. You love those that you hated. And you now hate those that you love. You have new thoughts about God. You now view him as your father. You have new thoughts about yourself. You have new thoughts about the world that you live in. You have new thoughts about the world to come. And this life that you have is the new life in Christ Jesus. This is the wonderful journey. So what is the application? How do you put this in practice? This is what Paul talked about in verse 19. He says, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting to sanctification. Because now we have understood that the outcome of this sanctification is eternal life. So you must present your life not to sin not to the world, not to yourself, but to God. And this is fundamental. You present everything that you have. Or we see that in the glorification section. We see that in Romans 12, where Paul urges us and says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. We need to present our bodies. We need to present our minds, our eyes, our our mouth, our ears, our tongue, every part of our body, our hands, and our feet, all these must be subject to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Every part of your body. And this is important. Why is it important? Because of what Paul states here, that this leads to sanctification. You are separated unto God. And having been separated unto God, the result of this, or the outcome of this, is eternal life. Therefore, for you who is watching us, I'm asking this question. Whose slave are you? Because that is important. If you are still a slave of sin, right now, the word of God is addressing you. Right now, Jesus 
comes to set you free. You need to believe this word. You need to have this word in your heart. This is the word of faith. This is the word that will bring you freedom. You need to agree with what God says. Without Jesus Christ, you are a slave of sin. But today, you can be set free in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Today, everything can come to an end in the name of the Lord. Today, every chain of bondage is broken in Jesus' name. Today, you can come to God as a sinner. And this moment, every chain will be broken. You will be loosed from your infirmity and your life will take a new turn. You will cease to be a slave of sin and you will now transition. Are you ashamed of what you're doing? Are you ashamed of who you are? It can end today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Why don't you say this prayer with me? Say, God of heaven, creator of the universe, redeemer of mankind, I am a sinner. I need a savior in my life. And this savior is Jesus Christ. I believe, Lord, that you were born and came and died for my sin. And you rose again from the dead and are seated with the Father. Today, I invite you into my life as my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sin. Come live in me. Come transform my life to live for you. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you say those words, from the bottom of your heart. This is what the Bible says, that it is with the heart that we believe and are justified. And it is with the mouth that we confess and we are saved. You are saved. It is not active, it is passive. So you believe, you confess, and he does the rest. He breaks the chains. You have now been delivered from the bondage of sin and now are a slave of God. He gives you a new heart. He gives you a new life. He gives you a new direction. All things have become new. The outcome of this is eternal life. Now for you who is right in there. You are not sure. This is what the word of God says. It says, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples. It does not it is not a jumping, jump out. Perseverance is the mark of a true disciple. Perseverance in the word of God. Perseverance in the knowledge of the truth. That will set you free. So for those that are wonderful saved, you are once a slave of sin. You are now a slave of God. Hallelujah. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous.
blessing us. Continue on this wonderful journey. And goodness and mercy will follow you. All the days of your life. It was a joy having you with us. And we know that the Lord is blessing you. For those of you who have given your life to Jesus Christ, there is that number on your screen. Please call. Tell us what God is doing. For those of you that are watching and listening to us, please send in testimony of what God is doing here. And let's celebrate God's goodness in this land of the living. So from Dominion Church, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for learning with us. And God richly bless you. So till we meet, we're saying, Shalom.